Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Today we're looking at a 1990s Denon DCD-F100 CD player. This was a, a piece that was a multi-component system, part of a small hi-fi uh, Denon, Onkyo, Kenwood, Pioneer, Iowa, Sony. Pretty much everybody in the 1990s came up with mini hi-fi systems and they were just that. They were designed for small spaces where you wanted good sound. Now this one comes to us from its owner and uh, it's been here a couple of times for regular maintenance, but recently the machine started mistracking. And when it started mistracking, she was incredibly smart enough to realize that the laser pickup was likely the fault, purchased a disk drive, and then somebody may have gone to attempt to install it, either she or someone else. And whatever came of that, we don't know because the disk drive is still in its box. And when she brought it to me, it showed no signs of life. It was completely utterly dead and we're missing some power supply voltages which I'll go over in just a moment here so we're going to open the machine up and I'm going to show you what I found and we're going to see if we can re resurrect this thing to the point where it functions uh, and if we can do so then see about replacing the disk drive transport so let's first of all get it open and then we can see what's going on on the inside so looking inside here this is a very simple but well-made machine this is your power transformer, your small regulated power supply, connections to the front panel where the uh, microprocessor and such is. And what we were finding is, let me get some light on the situation, is that when I applied power, we weren't getting anything other than the standard 12 volt supply input. Let me just plug this into my bench here. And so this should technically be in standby. So I should be able to uh, probe here on these test points and we should be getting voltages here. Now, let me see if I can show you where I'm going to be measuring. But right here, you can see we have command lines, a power on and off, a mute, a 5 volt a ground, a minus 27 for the display, the fluorescent. Those are critical voltages. But when I measure here, let's do so in such a way that you can actually see what I'm measuring. So here's our 5 volt line. And as we can see, there's utterly nothing there. Our minus 27 volt supply is there. So the display could theoretically work if it had command lines. Our fluorescent heater there, minus 22 volts, that's about right. There should be some AC riding on top of that. Let's see how much. 1.7 AC, that's about normal. Maybe a little less than I would have liked. Uh, but when we come down to the unregulated supply that's coming directly out of the transformer, we've got 11 volts. That's probably our ground. There's 48 volts for the voltage divider there, but basically the transformer is alive, it is running, we come to the rectifiers, we've got minus 15, and we've got plus 15, so the unregulated supply is functioning. Uh, so what we have to do is determine where the fault lies. Now another thing that you may have noticed is that there's this burn spot on the board down here. Uh, and in that burn spot, there is a Zener diode, which usually establishes a reference for the voltage. And there's a regulator transistor next to it, which could be thought of as a series pass device or an impedance matching device. There are some capacitors that I have replaced previously here. These are newer. These are newer. So my thought is, is that either A, the main regulator here has failed, or the one downstream for the 5 volts has failed, or there's a short somewhere in this circuit that's causing it. So let's flip this around briefly here. And I'm not sure if you can see that. That is a 78, 7808. So in theory, I don't think I have enough room to stick a regular probe down in here, but we can see. Maybe I do. At the output of the 8-volt regulator, there is 
7.95 volts there I saw it flash briefly there we go so this one is alive so that tells us that very likely this darkened area is probably where our issue lies so the next step is is let's get this board out so that we can have a better look at it and check the components now without taking it out usually what occurs in a failure like this is either a short on the input side of the regulator causing it to go to to be pulled down or a short on the output side or the regulator is just plain old open so I'm going to measure across the Zener diode and we should get some kind of a diode drop here and we do so that tells us that this is not shorted that's your ground side and then this is your hot side so this is regulating a negative voltage because the cathode's at ground so then leaves the little transistor here and it's not really possible to access that here so we need to now take the board up and that's a matter of just disconnecting everything and pulling the board up we may have to take the back off too but that's not hard to do these just unplug thankfully there's not much to them screw on the back which holds the whole back panel in and then we have various screws on the board here that's a good idea to make note of anywhere there was a longer screw so this one that I just pulled out of the back here I'm going to put a little L down for long helps in assembly unplug our disk drive and now with some finesse I should be able to pull the back panel and the board out and away from the chassis and now we can put the chassis aside and focus on the board So if we take a look at the back side, assuming it'll focus for me here, we can see that there's a lot of solder work that I had done previously, and of course replacing those capacitors. Now even if a capacitor was open, it's very unlikely that it would cause a complete loss of voltage. And based on the fact that this capacitor and these are all on the input side, it's also very unlikely that they're shorted otherwise we probably would have blown the primary on the transformer because it's just a thermal fuse and that likely would have killed it and there are currently no shorts across any of these capacitors discharge this one yep it does charge let's double check this one here is charging so there's no low resistances here let's go ahead and double check these smaller ones that work as part of the regulation circuit that charges up that charges and discharges okay and that charges and discharges let's see we also have this here it's ICPN 15 that is a integrated circuit protector and that is open I'm pretty sure that should not be open so let's take a look at what's downstream of that 
there's a capacitor right here that's directly in series with the trace. I'll point that out there. Yep, that trace is on the low side of this IC protector. So the fact that this is open suggests that something downstream, perhaps this capacitor, is to blame. Let's take a look at this. And see if I can get it to measure. Charges and discharges rather rapidly. And you are a unreadable thing. Nope, you're a 10 microfarad according to what I can muster here. And there's the 10 up there. All right. So the purpose of the IC protector, of course, is to protect integrated circuits from a fault. And one thing we should do is measure the downside of that IC protector. And that would be this pin right here. And then I'm going to measure from the ground on the chassis and see if there's a short or a low resistance here. There's just that capacitor constantly charging and discharging. We should see a, a constant charge there. That's not correct. So, I have a feeling that this uh, 10 microfarad capacitor here, let's just go to manual range, may have something to do with why, <clears throat> excuse me, the machine died. It's a steady 10K there. So I don't think 10K would present a large enough load to uh, open that. But we're going to pull that out and test it anyways. In fact, we'll test the remaining original Samsung capacitors in here because they're not known for being the greatest. All right, so let's break out our capacitor wizard as I drop my bottle of cleaner on the floor. And let's just go to this 10 microfarad out of curiosity. And that registers fairly poorly. That should really be about down to a 1.5 or a 1. Let's compare with a new device just for the hell of it. And a new device, you can see it's closer to 1.5. That may not seem like a big enough change, but when you're in small digital circuitry like this, uh, capacitors are everything. So we will change that. There's this guy down here. Still tests okay. Here's another regulator circuit here. He tests about a one. Yeah, so this 10 at 50 also is kind of poor. And they're not consistent either. If they were consistent rating for both 10s, I would say that's probably just what they are. Here's another cap I replaced back in the, when it was last serviced. It's still fine. And then our main electrolytic, still good. Still good, still good. Let's check the little transistor. Make sure that it didn't suffer a failure. Yep, no shorts, no opens. MPSA 56. Interesting that they have a American transistor in a Japanese product. Okay, we're looking good there. So let's go ahead and replace that 10 microfarad capacitor and we'll replace the IC protector too, assuming I have one. If not, I'll have to order one, but that's probably the reason why it's dead is because that IC protector deals with the 5 volt supply to the front panel. So we have to wonder if this buffer capacitor here was the reason why it died or if there's something still down the road that's not quite right. 
So I've just soldered that cap, pulled it out, and we're going to put the new one in and solder it in. Sometimes they just open those IC protectors. Sometimes it requires an external influence. But it's a solid 10K, so that's probably good enough. And yeah, there's your reference there for the 5 volt. And I like how, well, they do have a warning here. Let's see if we can read it. ICP N15. So that's probably like 15 milliampers. Let's see what that is. Okay, so according to Google, it's a 0.6 ampere IC protector. Let's see if I have one of those. If not, we'll just order one. Okay, so in fact, I do have some N15s. See if it'll focus on that there. There we go. There's our IC protector. Let's just double check and make sure that it is alive. And there we are. We do have continuity there. So that tells us that this is good to install. So let's go ahead and yank the old one. you can go away and it's a good idea with old parts that have been sitting in a bag for a while that are somewhat oxidized like this one is to uh, scrape away at the oxide so that the leads are nice and shiny and the solder can stick to it so bend the leads over solder this guy in Trim the leads off. Not really happy with that. Let's go ahead and flow that a little bit better. And there we are. That's nice and soldered in. Nice looking. We'll check the connections around the uh, regulator IC, make sure that it's not breaking loose, doesn't appear to be. So now this thing's ready to go back in, and we'll see if it comes back to life or not. Alright, fast forward a bit, clear off the bench enough so I can work on this. And then let's go ahead, get this into frame so you can see it a little better. We'll go ahead and put our board back in. He comes by like clockwork, driving his motorcycle and playing a wide variety of music. Kind of like to meet him. All right, let's plug that in, that in. This one does not want to cooperate. There we go. And let's plug our front panel boards in. Our power transformer. I do apologize for the shaking. I keep seeming to bump the camera mount. Why does this one want to fight me? There we go. It's just picky about how it goes in. Okay. 
And then, of course, I forget the transformer leads here. Right. Now let's put our hardware back in. Making sure everything is seated first. And then of course the long screw that goes back here that we've marked on the board. And the one that holds the panel. Okay, now it's time to plug it in and see if it comes back alive. Here we are. And what I'm going to do is take my probe and monitor the downside of that IC protector that previously blew out. And we're going to see if we plug it in, do I get 5 volts? I get 7.9. Okay. But it is registering that it is alive. So let's go back to our 5 volt test point. And I am getting 4.897. So, it is assumed that the set is alive. I hear the drawer belt slipping. It's not wanting to open. Yeah, that belt is very tired. So we will need to change that. So, we're at, uh, we're back at where it was before it failed and it's presumed that the machine is skipping so one thing I can do uh, since this person has been a very good customer is we can swap the disk drive and see if that in fact fixes the problem with the skipping and also obviously our drawer belt needs to be replaced too so let's go ahead and remove power while it is open so that I don't have to fight with the latching mechanism that opens and closes the drawer. And let's get it apart so we can change both the belt and the disk drive. Alright, so to get the, to the disk drive and to the loader, we need to remove two screws that are on the top of the transport. This takes off the clamping assembly. we see that there's a disk drive there. And this particular one is the KSM 213 CCM, which is probably the most popular disk drive that was uh, produced. Now with the clamper removed, we should be able to get the drawer free enough If I can get this out, although it wants to fight me today. That's your door detect switch. Trying to see if there's a way that I can do this without stressing anything because it is old plastic. Or maybe I can even just get the belt off without having to do that. Well, anyways. The belt is the more difficult task, uh, so I'm going to do the disk drive first. Since the accessibility of the disk drive is far better than the belt, and I can always give it a push to finish the loading cycle. So we're going to remove the four screws that hold the disk drive in. That one back there I might need a different tool for. And I may have to remove the entire assembly here depending on how straightforward it is to get this screw out, but that's not impossible. Yeah, 
It may be simpler to do that. So scratch that. We're going to remove the entire assembly. I'm going to push this almost closed. And there's perimeter screws to remove holding this in. It appears that one or more are missing, which could have been a function of the previous service attempt. All right, so this comes up and out. Go ahead and move this aside. It appears that that doesn't really change the prospect of the belt change. Well, I can access the belt through here very likely with some hemostats and a little clever work. So let's get back to focusing on the disk drive if that's possible. I guess if I push this aside, I can get this out. Now you may notice that the suspension is different color. There's green in the front and purple in the back. That is important. Do not mix these up because it will affect how the disc drive floats inside of the transport and it will cause you no end of headaches. I'm moving the pickup to the back so I can disconnect the ribbon that communicates with the servo board and then we're going to work this out. And as you can see, two of the uh, grommets have come out and that may just be to my benefit actually as far as reinstalling them so remove the back two and let's get the replacement transport set that aside bear with me one moment Okay, so here's the one provided. That's a 213 CCM. And we'll put our grommets in. And then there's always a solder bridge on the pickup of these 213 series Sonys, which is back here. This must be removed before you attempt to install it. Otherwise, what this does is it shorts the laser diode to ground, and not only will it not work, but you can actually hurt the integrated circuits that drive this. So, we want to make sure that that has been removed prior to installation. And I need to hope that this is a genuine pickup and not a counterfeit or aftermarket cheapie, otherwise it's not going to work very well. So we'll remove the solder bridge. There it is, nice and clean. And so we'll hook this back up. This is our motor board. And then I have to slide the transport into the grommets. Which may require that I raise them up just a pinch. Need the tool. And of course, this one's going to fight me. So let's just try it the good old fashioned way and remove them. Install them on the transport and then attempt to install the transport. They may have just popped out for whatever reason. Okay, nope, I have to insert the other way because this connector has to go underneath this plate. And yep, these want to pop out, which is why they came out during the removal. So let's lift up on that, gain us a little more ground. And the purple one pops out. This is going to be fun. The reason why I did not take it apart any further is because I put the machine at great risk 
being that the plastics are old and brittle on this, taking it apart to the degree that would allow me to get the transport in with ease. And it is harder to replace that. These plastic loader parts here are harder to replace than other things. So I'd much rather do it this way. Let's lift. And I may need a couple of additional tools to get this in here. It's always easier to disassemble than it is to reassemble. But I'm going to try finessing it in here first. There we go. Now it's beginning to cooperate. And now we can reinstall the hardware, assuming I've not lost it. And it's kicking around over here. Now imagine putting one of these back together, only to discover that you forgot to desolder the bridge. Been there, done that. It's really frustrating. And then finally, this one over here. Okay, so that puts that inside. And I suppose, well, let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. Let's see if this will reset here. And let's see if I can get the belt exchanged well, I've got this apart. This is where, again, hemostats to the rescue. I'm going to hold this pulley down since it is just resting on here while I get the belt off. That's no longer round for sure. I'm going to guess that's about a 3-inch belt. Let's see what an SCX 3.0 does. We're actually going to use an SCQ because it's a hair thicker. That's pretty close. Tiny little bit more stretch on this, so I think the three inches is where it's at. Now, because this is thicker, this may present a little more of a challenge to get on the pulley here, but we'll find out, won't we? We'll see if I can do this in such a way that you guys can actually see. Push up on this to get it over the hub there. And then we'll push up on this so we can get the belt over it like that. Push up on this again so that the belt can clear the motor. little bit of a push. Yeah. All right. And then get it on the motor pulley. Oh. Almost had it. I can tell this is where the fun's going to start. Let's go ahead and push this over here. Now, one complication of this often is that the belt, which I think is going to happen here, rubs on the gears. So the ultra thick belt that I thought was going to be so awesome now impedes the system. So we cannot use an SCQ 3.0 because it simply doesn't work. We have to use the thin belt. Now that's kind of a poor design because it means that the overall available traction for the system is somewhat limited and that means that the complications from a slightly aged belt can cause the system to malfunction, which is obviously what was happening here. So I thought maybe thicker belt would work, but nope, 
we have to use the standard size belt. So let me go find one of those. Okay, so let's see if I can use the three inch standard belt. Up and over the pulley. And let's push this up so that I can get the belt on the pulley. Push it back down. Get it cleared over the motor hub. And then onto the pulley it goes. And see that does not impede operation there. But time will tell to see if the little skinny belt will actually be able to provide enough torque to complete the loading cycle, which we'll know in a little bit. So let's install our disk drive, and let's get the machine turned on after that. Let's just make sure this is all routed properly. Thankfully, this is a very straightforward installation, which meant that they had the kindness and forethought to make a machine that was serviceable, which you just don't see anymore. I think the 90s was really the last good years for audio equipment that was still serviceable, because after the 90s, uh, serviceability went in the, went in the toilet. Okay, let's mount our clamp. Now if this belt doesn't work, I'm going to have to find something else that works in its place. Keep bumping the camera mount. It is hovering over me, so it's like kind of in my way. Okay, so let's plug this in. And let's turn it on and eject it. And it does not complete the loading cycle. I can hear it slipping. Now if I help it, it will complete. So that belt is not going to work for that application. I need to find something better. Because on its own it doesn't complete. So again, uh, that goes back to the very poor engineering aspect of this where they didn't use the proper means to get it to work. And I can put a slightly tighter belt on there uh, which may fix our problem. Uh, but then the problem is, of course, is now there's more lateral stress on the motor. So, not really the, bra the, uh, the brightest design, but we have to change the belt out to something a little bit more snug so that it can finish the loading cycle on its own, because that's really important. It's not going to do much if it can't finish its loading cycle. So let's go ahead and yank the thin belt, and let's see if I can find something a little bit tighter than this. Okay, so I've gone from a, roughly a 3.1 inch to a 2.9 inch. And given the difficulty of getting it over the pulley, that's a little bit tighter than I'd like. But if the 3.1 doesn't work, we really don't have much of a choice. And I don't like using excessively tight belts. I just don't do that. Okay, let's see how the 2.9 does. I'm hoping it's better. And I'm going to put the screws to hold it down just yet until we can validate it will complete a loading cycle. So let's turn this on. Ah, that's a good sign. Open. Close. 
and it clamps very good. Okay, I can remove power again and put the screws back in and we'll replace the two missing screws that hold the transport in. Now we just have to hope that the uh, new laser will keep it from skipping. And here's two additional screws that it does not have before. And All right. So let's go ahead and test it and see if it will play. Okay, so what I'm going to do is insert a homemade disc and see if it will recognize and play this. The reason why I use a homemade disc is because the data density is much smaller and it's more difficult to read. Now that does not recognize the disc at all. So not good. Now let's make sure I did everything right here. And I see instantly what's wrong. I didn't hook up the ribbon cable. So let's remove power temporarily. And let's see if I can install the ribbon cable without having to pull the entire disk drive again. Okay, almost there. Let me get onto the plastic here. There's one side, and there's the other side. Okay. A little bit of stupidity, but life happens. Let's try this again. Does it recognize it? I hear the laser trying. It's going tick, 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 tick. Disc spins freely. But no dice. Let's try a regular commercial disc. If the commercial disc reads, then that tells us that the laser that was supplied was a pull and was probably weak. but it doesn't read that either. So now let's take a look at our eyeball and see if we are actually getting power to the laser. And let me pop the clamper off and then we'll move the camera to a point where we can see what the laser pickup is doing. Alright, so if we take a look, and there's our eyeball right there in the center, and I'm going to hit close, and we're going to see if it energizes. It does. So the laser itself is operational, meaning that the diode is emitting laser light, however, uh, for whatever reason, it's not recognizing that there is a disk there, and that could be because the photoreceptor matrix is bad, uh, or it could be something else downstream, which the failure may have actually caused a little IC protector to die, since it is all in the 5 volt line. So, what we really have to do is replace the laser and with a good known part, and see if that will actually cause the machine to work right again. So, time to take the disk drive out again. Now if you're dexterous, 
and you have the ability to get underneath this release here. You can pop the lateral motion gear up, like so. And sometimes, if there's enough room, you can slide the uh, slide rail out and get the pickup off without taking everything apart. I don't think that's how this one's going to go, but I'm curious. And in fact, there might be enough room to do that. So that allows me to get the laser pickup off by itself. And let's go get a good known replacement. Okay, so I have a KSS 213D which is a superseded part of the original. And I'm going to see if this will function. I've already removed the solder bridge. So let's plug in our ribbon cable. Get it on the track. All right. Wonderful. And let's put our lateral motion gear back in. Clicks into place. Well, let's see if this pickup works. Okay, in goes our burn disc. Oh, silly me. It still doesn't recognize it. doesn't even try to spin the motor. And if we come up to the laser eye again, you see the laser emits, but does nothing else. Now, one way you can see if it's power to the motor board failure is move the pickup back and see if it resets. And it does. So I am getting power to the motor board. But the fact that the machine is not recognizing the disc uh, tends to suggest that the actual failure mode, which may have killed the IC protector, uh, is very likely in the servo circuitry. So I'm not sure if it's going to be practical to fix this one because it would require the purchase of a parts unit to source the integrated circuit necessary to make this work. And at that point, it would be better just to buy a replacement board. So, can't fix them all. Uh, spending a lot of time on this would be impractical because it would just be really, really expensive. But that was the purpose initially of the diagnosis, was to figure out if when we brought the power supply back, did the rest of the machine function? And the answer is, mm, not really. So, we're just going to have to button this one, and it's really not going to be fixable, which is unfortunate, but still the case. So sadly it looks like we're going to have to close the book on this one. I thought that perhaps even maybe well my new pickups might be bad. So we put the original one back in which was purported to be working minus the skipping but still no recognition of the CDs. So my conclusion is is that something in the CD servo circuit probably failed and the brief failure caused the opening of the IC protector and interruption of the 5 volt line. And when we repaired the 5 volt line, although the machine appeared to be active and it will fire the laser, the circuitry responsible for receiving the RF, recognizing it and initializing the disc, is no longer operative. And so, yes, the laser shines on the disc, but otherwise there's nothing there. So. This isn't practical to repair without a donor machine, in which case you would probably be servicing the donor board and placing it in this machine or just getting another machine altogether. And it's unfortunate because these are hard to find and the ones that you can find are a pretty penny. So I think the owner of this is really going to be disappointed, but there's not much else I can do really. But I hope you guys enjoyed the troubleshooting experience to figure out what was actually wrong and where we got to where we got to. And uh, so, yeah, 
Hope you guys liked the video. More stuff to come.